my, my, I feel like my life is, has no meaning and purpose. So you think they can fix that? No, I, your life doesn't have any meaning and purpose. Not objective meaning or purpose. Yeah, it's just, it's just you have to create meaning for yourself, right? You got to make it inside. You got to look inside yourself, and you make meaning. See, you don't have to be limited by all of those. What people tell you you have to be, what society tells you you have to be, or what religion tells you you have to be. No, look inside. Inside. Wow, that that sounds very appealing. Yeah. <laughs> so what about, what is the appeal what you know we talked you talked in the intro about you know finding the purpose within yourself I mean, I, you know, I posit that with the modernists, they gave us science and they gave us, you know, they gave us the atomic bomb and they gave us all these, you know, they also gave us Darwin and evolution and they, they gave us astrophysics and they gave us scientists that tell us that there's no ultimate metaphysical meaning to life, um, that um, we, only get, we only need to find, you know, if, if, we, if we're afraid to space that reality. I guess the only meaning we can find in is our own individual slices of life. So um, when you have that taken away, that, that sense of meaning taken away, you know, would postmodernist provide something, an alternative that would seem meaningful to a person? Yeah, uh, well, that's where they want us. They want you to find your own meaning. They want you to decide what your meaning is. Meaning comes from you. Not from, not from society, it doesn't come from God, it doesn't come from anything external to you. Now what this, the appeal I think of it is, is uh, I get to express myself I want. I get to be who I want. I get to, um, I don't have to be shamed or be, feel bad for doing, for not meeting up with society's expectations and norms, right? Because... Mm -hmm. There, because society and they often think that there is some kind of objective morality. There is some objective meaning, and if you don't conform to that, then you're bad, you're wrong, you're evil. There's something wrong with you. Well, I have all these sort of impulses and drives to do things that seem to be in contradiction to the things that society expects of me. Well, if I can say. Well, those expectations really aren't objective. Those aren't objective and binding on me. Or there isn't any, those, their sense of what meaning and purpose is, that doesn't apply to me. Mm -hmm. I can just make up my purpose. I can make up my meaning. I can create those things. And I can, I can be whatever I want to be. Why wouldn't I want that? You know? And, th and those things that are taboo would look, be looked upon as things that are a carryover from a culture that looks upon certain things a certain way. So what mm -hmm. is this culture's, you know, what, what what weight does this culture have over what I want to do? Like if they're all on equal ground. So just because this culture thinks this thing is taboo or, or not doesn't mean that, you know, it's right for me. It's it's what, you know, it's the meaning and purpose I find in my identity, um, in whatever identity I want to, want, to, uh, want to create. That's one manifestation, yeah. Yeah, the... But there is a kind of, in postmodernism, I think there is a carryover even from the, the Hegel and Marx with this, this notion of continual progressing, right? I think that part carried over, but it carried over while jettisoning the idea that we can use, you know, man's reason to determine what the ideal society would be like or to determine what the right mm -hmm. um so in a in a sense it it becomes a lot more individualistic right i live my mm -hmm. life you live your life you know 
<laughs> my next question is, okay, say we have, and I find my own personal meaning, and it is contrary to the overall culture's understanding of what I should, how I should live my life. So if those two things come into conflict, what is the result? Like who, who, who wins in that battle? Um, between what I think and what society thinks or, or group thinks. Um, and will those things come into conflict? I think that's the worry about postmodernism is it doesn't seem to have the internal resources to settle that problem, settle the problem of who wins outside of conflict, right? Because it's minimized the role of reason. So now argument and debate... Um, argument and debate as a way to resolve things are not as meaningful or important for the postmodern. So then now when you've created yourself, when you've got these meanings, you can find other people who have similar affinities and you can try to win. You know, I, I think un unfortunately what I think it ultimately comes down to is for the postmodern is who wins is just who's stronger or who's smarter or who's able to get an edge in over the group that thinks less like them. Um, and ironically, that's the thing they kind of were trying to avoid in the first place, right? Is to, mm -hmm. so that one group doesn't oppress the other group. There's a lot of, I think, paradox in postmodernism, right? Like there is no objective morality, but they tend to be very, pretty moralistic, you know, and there's, there's not a, there isn't, objective meaning but they have a very very strong sense of purpose in the world a lot of times right um so i think postmodernism is paradoxical and i think if you're a modernist it just looks absurd it it looks like mm -hmm. okay you guys are just you guys are um diminishing the very thing that sets you apart from every other creature in the, in the world namely your reason and once you do that now it is just sort of uh, conflict. It, now it's just whoever wins, the survival of the fittest, the survival of the strongest. And the modernist a lot of times sees that as a debasement of humanity. And the postmodernist sees it as a kind of liberation. I think you, post, you said something very uh, interesting that I thought of a, a word that popped in my head when, say, when they come into conflict, you know, and how you can resolve that. Like, in the, in the old days medieval uh, even in the modern age um there is a thing called diplomacy is that you use your intellect you use reason you use compromise to arrive at a middle ground where not everybody gets what they want but everybody can walk away kind of satisfied with what they can live with um you know that's a tolerance mm -hmm. um I think it comes out of the Enlightenment that there's a tolerance. But yeah. I think with, with postmodernism and, and some of its children and grandchildren, um, I'm talking like intersectionality and identity uh, politics, that there's no such thing as like free speech. There's not really an understanding of tolerance that is like a, a liberal uh, understanding of tolerance. Uh, and acceptance in terms of like, hey, you can think what you think and I can think what I think and we can all agree that we will allow each other that space. Um, but now it's, you know, if you don't think what I think, then you are X, Y, and Z. You know, you are not, you do not then belong in in the, the camp of humanity anymore. Um, you belong outside. And so I think what you see with the cancel culture and people that have said the wrong thing or thought the wrong thing, that they get, you know, kind of pushed away. Uh, it's even kind of a, like almost like a religious thing. Um, you know, looking at in the medieval or, you know, ancient church with the anathema or excommunication. Someone who is excommunicated from the church as a means to encourage their repentance and then return mm -hmm. to the church. Um, it almost seems like that. Like there's this like, like a Twitter anathema or that Twitter <laughs> excommunication yeah. of people who say the wrong things or are not uh, sensitive to the right things. 
and uh, and with our culture right now, I think you know our culture overall, like with the media and and the overall pervasive uh, kind of use the German word zeitgeist or spirit of the age, is very much in the in the camp of uh, you know postmodernists and like I said the children of, and grandchildren of postmodernism in terms of encouraging that behavior. So now it's very it's a very volatile. Uh, situation, you know, even within families and within culture and on the internet. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's getting to a point where, uh, you know, who's going to win? It's it's down to power, you know. Yeah. Power well, politics and who right. who's your guy and who you know who you're going to support and it's a, uh, it's pretty scary. Yeah, well, I think you hit some hit on something there, and I and I I know other people have said something along these lines too is that what we're seeing today these sort of children of postmodernism and other other kind of ideologies uh really does smack of religious of of a and when i say religious i mean i i I think that's probably a little broad i'd say more specifically more cultic like a cultic kind of mindset and i know because i was involved in some cultic churches (laughs) like there were, there were some churches that I went to that were spiritually abusive and, and they were mm-hmm. manipulative and it was all or nothing thinking. It was, uh, you know, you don't question the authority. Um, so this sort of mindset is very familiar to me. I mean, I, I look at what's going on uh, in the culture wars now and it looks like a, a religious cult. And, you know, if you think about it, like if you think the other side is just if you if you end up dividing and tribe making the other tribe into this like literally evil, horrific group, um, if you don't have some higher principle to moderate that or to mediate that, why would you not do everything you can to destroy them? You know, these people are a threat. Mm -hmm. Let's get rid of them. We need to stop them at, at, at any cost. Unless you have some kind of principle of moderation, some kind of principle in common that both can look to and say, hey, that there's something that transcends both of us that we need to look to to deal with our dispute. If, if that's not it, then the tribalism wins out and we basically, it's, it's zero-sum game. It's either mm-hmm. you or me, buddy. You know, And I think that's what we're seeing. And I think, too, about the appeal... I, I, I kind of go back to this, but I, I think people want their lives to have meaning. They want their lives to count for something. Yeah, yeah. They don't want to just go through life and just, you know, day after day, go to work, come home, go to sleep. You know, they want to they wanna have um, a soul, you know. And I think, I think uh, you know, when you, when you take away, uh, like I said, the ultimate meaning that was traditionally provided to people is that, Hey, there's a God in the universe and this God created this universe for you and ultimately wants you to know it. And then wants to come to know you. And then you come back to, to the, to God, you know, that's the overarching understanding of Judeo Christian, even Islam. Um, I mean, you say Hinduism too, like everything is God, everything's going to come back to God. You know, there's a sense that you belong, to this cosmic, uh, you're, you're a part of this cosmic story. And when we're taught in school from very early age, if we go to public school about science and it's all devoid of God and any sort of meaning, and then we kind of like graduate from high school, we get out in the real world and we see, you know, everybody's out there, you know, doing their thing. And, and we're like, where do I fit? Where do I belong? Um, I mean, I was a Christian, I could be a Christian when I was 15 and, and, Honestly, before I was a Christian, I didn't have any direction or guidance or anything. I can't even imagine what my life would have been like if I hadn't have, have found, you know, had Christ had found me um, and then directed me and led me away from the path that I was on before. Who knows where I would have ended up? Mm-hmm. And then if I was that same person as a 15 year old now, where all these, you know, you have the internet, you have all these different, you know, different worldviews, different combating, you know, uh, perspectives on on life and how you can live your life and who you are and what you what you are on the inside as opposed to the outside all these different you know 
plethora of options, I don't know what I would choose. You know, back in the day, you know, in the late '80s, it wasn't there weren't a lot of options. <laughs> you know, it was what were what were the options back when we were younger? I mean, really, it's either I think I was either just normal, regular guy, or or you know, a religious person, or or whatever. Like there was not a lot of there wasn't a lot of opportunity to uh, kind of explore different things. Um, but now it's like there's just so many. Yeah. Um, and and these these. Um, these groups, and, and I'm going to use a you know intersectionality in terms of things. So, if you have like a, a, a certain about something about you that appeals to these groups, then then you you have a, a, a point of meaning, a purpose, and then these groups then bring you in, and they make you a part of them, and they give you an identity, they give you a, a, a like I said a purpose, and they also give you a goal. And on top of that, if, if they don't agree with you or you don't agree with them, they give you a, a enemy, um, you know, a hill to conquer, a, a, a yeah, devil yeah, sure. to destroy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're, I think another thing kind of uh, picking up on what you were talking about is, okay, what you gain with this mentality is maybe freedom to do what you want freedom to create your own meaning freedom to create your own morality freedom to create who you are but it's a trade-off right like okay now you don't have a, this objective meaning you don't have this objective purpose you don't have this objective morality it's, you make it up but then what do you belong to and that that sense of belonging i think is exaggerated when you pick up that mindset and I've seen people who, who have gone down this road. They might be in the public sphere. They might be down with the evil people, whatever cause they're for. Uh, mm -hmm. But internally and privately, like, they're like, what's the point? What am I doing? Like, I mean, okay, let's say we win this battle next. Not, not, what's after that? Now what? Um, they just got to find another battle to fight, right? It, it, that's where they find their meaning and purpose a lot of times. I think that's a terrible trade-off to give up on objective meaning because you, you think there, that it doesn't exist and, and then you think that when people do think it exists, then you, it results in the Holocaust or it results in the killing mm -hmm. of millions of people. Or right now, It doesn't do that every time. Like it depends on what your meaning is. <laughs> you know, it depends on a lot of factors. It's not just that. But what you what you give up in exchange for your f just ultimate freedom is per is actual purpose is actual meaning is actual legitimate morality and i i, I think you're hitting something big is in terms of we want to feel like we belong to something well i think douglas murray calls it the the god-shaped hole mm -hmm. is that i think uh, modernism kind of and then the postmodernism after it kind of removed, uh, like God, the Judeo-Christian God from people's lives, that that ultimately gave them meaning and purpose. And then now they have a hole in their heart, and they need they're stuffing it with what they think will make them full and give them meaning. But all it does is just create, you know, more more hunger, more more you know, more things that they can glob onto doesn't have any purpose i mean the, the thing about christianity and like judaism and is they've been around for a long time and there have they have long traditions and they have a track record of success um and you can see that other people have come before you have lived the faith have have been victorious have done certain things and you can see the success there but with this current God-shaped hole, I mean, there's not really this, not that it matters if there's a track record, but you know what I'm saying? It's just basically, it's what can they fill in there more? And, and like I said, it's leading to like a chaos. Like, a, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm kind of pessimistic about it. Um, but I just feel like the answer, I mean, I guess you say it's subjectively because you and me, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is Christ. You know, that's the answer. Um, but Christ comes with um, 
other things that I think some people who, who ident want to identify that way would, wouldn't want, you know, because it's what, it's the overall objective truth, it's objective morality, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the big O, big, you know, um, because, you know, orthodoxy is a, is something that means, you know, that's an objective religious uh, theological truth. Um, so objective, you have to buy into objective truth um, as a Christian. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I just don't, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. But. Yeah, yeah, I, I... I tend to think that if if a, if a philosophical viewpoint or a theological viewpoint or something like that um, doesn't have the internal resources to sustain things like meaning and purpose and morality, then it just it's going to fizzle out. Uh, because I mean I would I mean I think that certainly the the great monotheistic religions of uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has the resources to be able to explain why we need to be moral. And whether you agree mm -hmm. with those or not, at least at least it has the resources to do that. And even in Hinduism, um, I'm not sure about Buddhism, but Buddhism seems to have scattered into so many different things. Sometimes it's not even really hardly recognizable as a religion uh, in some of its manifestations. But I think in the more religious manifestations of it, it does have some, at least some resources to sustain meaning and purpose and morality. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm optimistic about postmodernism not taking too deep of a root. I mean, it could be our entire lifetime. I don't know. Maybe for the rest of our life. And it leads to all sorts of terrible things. That's possible. I mean, I, but I think the, when, I'm, when I'm thinking optimistically, I'm thinking really long term. Like, I don't think mm -hmm. it's something that could take root for very long. Well, I just think, you know, Douglas Murray is a, he's from England. And I guess England is always kind of a little bit ahead of us in terms of these cultural things um, taking shape because they're kind of a smaller, you know, group set. Um, there's a lot more diversity in the United States. But he said that there was a survey done in London of those uh, uh, below 18. And they said, and, they, and the survey showed that 40% of 18-year-old or below 18-year-old Londoners, 40% of them identified as gender fluid. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, <laughs> says a lot about how postmodernism and this, you know, the identity and stuff, how that's influencing, especially those under 18. And, um, you know, that, that, you know, if that continues... You know what's going to happen because those are the people that are going to be leading our countries in you know 20 years 20 or 30 years unless there's a correction that happens before then i'm not too optimistic about that you know well look the damage is going to be done well no one denies that damage can be done right of course and, and it could last a generation or two or three i don't know i mean that kind of thing does happen what i'm saying is long term I'm optimistic. It may not happen in our lifetime. It might happen not in my kids' lifetime. I don't know. But I'm saying long term, those, I think, philosophies and theologies and whatnot that do not have some kind of uh, ability to sustain objective meaning, objective morality, uh, uh, objective purpose, that kind of stuff, will not last very long. I mean, yeah, it could get horrible before it gets better. But mm -hmm. I, this is something too. Read, you know, when you read the natural law theorists, that's what I like about the natural law theorists is that you look through fascism or communist communism or whatever, and if you were living during that time, you would have been overwhelmed to see the uprising and the the, the just the flooding of the entire mm -hmm. world with these ideologies, right? It would have been overwhelming. And if you and if you felt a hint of optimism, you might have seen a, been seen as naive or stupid. But that's at, true. <laughs> but I think, but I think there's a sense in which that that did work out its course. Now new things are going to come in the future that maybe that are probably just modifications of old things, 
and they're going to mm-hmm. cause death and destruction and mayhem, right? Like that's going to be something that every generation has to face to one degree or another. Fortunately, the generation immediately following World War II at least had some time of uh, peace and prosperity and uh, decency and things like that. But every generation is going to have to face whatever ideologies come and go that are going to bring about chaos and mayhem and destruction. What I'm saying is that, and this is something the natural law theorists say, is that if you get too far away from human nature ultimately human nature will draw you back right this is a this is this, you can't get too far from it uh before you get drawn back um and that there's a sort of unfolding and learning from past mistakes and hopefully going in the right direction but then also failing look at the history of israel look at the history of the church look at i mean the whole history is this undulating up and down Things get really bad and they get better and then they get really bad and they get better and they get really... uh, Yeah, that's because things don't get too far from human nature before we're we're all like, crap, what have we done to ourselves? You know? Mm -hmm. So when I say I'm optimistic, I'm not necessarily saying... I'm not at at all trying to imply that things couldn't get bad. I mean, things are already bad. Uh, Here in the United States, I've never seen anything politically like this before in my life. Like, the amount of hatred one group has for the other, well, both groups have for each other, I've never seen that before, ever. And I guess I have some optimism, too. I think there are people, like, you know, uh, you said earlier, um, I don't think it was when we were recording, but that, you know, the reflection of the culture it is a, is a, it's either a reflection of the success or the failure of the church. Mm-hmm. And I think... Um, that we're as a church are going to have to come to understanding that we need to, we need to step up and, um, and do something and be, and be more bold and be more, be more, uh, but not, I mean, not in a, in a bad and in an abusive way, but more in like a a charitable, Mm -hmm. but in loving way, but like stand up for truth and stand up for what, um, what, what is right. And I think, like I said, like podcasts like this and other things we see online, um, is a way for, um, people who are, who are struggling out there that may not know where to turn or may feel like they don't, they don't have a, a purpose or meaning and they're kind of being tempted to one direction or another. They can stumble upon something like this and say, okay, yeah, I, I can see where I can, you know, what, what true purpose and meaning can come from. And that's what I mean. That's the appeal of, of what I hope, like I said, if there's a high school student or a college student who's struggling and they want to know um, where they can find true meaning and purpose, you know, I would say come to Christ. Uh, he will he will provide that for you um and you know if there have any questions or want to talk to somebody or have any any you know they can contact us or or you know their local church or you know someone that can actually guide them um to a, to a life that's fulfilled mm-hmm. you know because i think you both and i both agree that our lives before christ or or where our lives now are um, is because of Christ, and we would not be where we are today without without His influence and and giving us purpose and meaning, and giving us a fullness of life. Yeah. So I like to you know I hope to appeal to those people that they that they don't have to have to turn to some sort of identity or um, that will ultimately leave them unsatisfied. Yeah, and I think you see in the pho- the Jordan Peterson phenomena, for example. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, especially men, in the church, have flocked to Jordan Peterson over and against the church, even in some cases. And I see that as a failure of the church to address the issues that Jordan Peterson is addressing. Mm-hmm. So they see yeah. in. Yeah, postmodernism has kind of infected the church a little bit. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I th- honestly, the, the emphasis on feeling and subjective uh, experience over objective reason or over doctrine or over things like that. I mean, these are all children of the of the postmodern movement. Um, is my just me and Jesus, me and my experience with Jesus? That's all that matters. Uh, you know, all this theology stuff, all of this 
um, anything that has to do with the world, who cares? Because the world's going to go up in flames anyway. So mm-hmm. you know, like that's not Christianity. That's postmodernism imbibed in the church. <laughs> you know, and when you see uh, baptized postmodernism, yeah, 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 and not and poorly baptized. <laughs> But you see that people flocking to someone like Jordan Peterson, saying th- things to him like, you brought me back from the brink of destruction kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And you think, why, does, why, why don't they flock to the church like that? Because Jordan Peterson, I think, presents a direction, a purpose that transcends just individual desires, a purpose that's not just selfishly motivated. Right? He's very mm-hmm. focused on contribution. You contribute to the world around you. Make yourself useful to those around you and your locally. Make yourself useful, right? Uh make you make your bed. Make your freaking bed. <laughs> yeah. That's what I thought when I when I was watching some of this stuff. I'm just like, everything he's saying is so like like simple. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so like practical. It's more like a practical um not theology, but like a I don't know. Uh, what, what kind of what do you say? Like not theology, but like a like a life lessons that sort of thing. Like very like boots on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, way of looking at, uh, at your life. Like if your if your if your bed is not made, which is like your fundamental thing in your life that you can just do every day. Like you can make your bed. It just takes five seconds. What the what's the rest of your life gonna look like? <laughs> you yeah. know. Uh, that that to me is such a like a revolutionary but such an obvious thing that you know everybody can relate to a messy bed yeah or, yeah, or think, a messy yeah, life that, or uh, yeah yeah i can totally agree with you there yeah because i think it's, i know it's more certainly in evangelical circles maybe you can speak more to the catholic circles but certainly in evangelical circles and you were even you know you were reformed before uh mm-hmm. so you know the there's this sole focus on the abstract right like the the abstract just me and jesus all you need is jesus all you right it's like what does that even mean like that's what frustrated me so much is you give all these abstract all you need is this or it's all it's all about sitting at the feet of jesus right what does that mean what does any of that mean it's no wonder that someone who like jordan peterson comes along and says Guys, get your act together. How about you go to work and you work really hard for a week straight, harder than you've ever worked before for a week straight, and see what that does for you. That's concrete, practical advice Mm -hmm. that may not be obvious what the outcome of that is, but when you do it, you see the value and the wisdom of it, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go to church every Sunday and it's just like, we just need to love Jesus, we need to love people, and there's no how what does that mean yeah, yeah we failed like, you know like feed the hungry uh right you know, yeah give you know action yeah you know clothe the naked you know take care of the widow you know in the orphan that sort of stuff you know very practical steps you can take to what, what james calls true religion yep and it wasn't hard stuff it was like how about you just not lie how about you not, you know, how about you take care of people when they need help? How about you, you know, those kinds of things. We all affirm those things as good. Uh, but how about just actually doing those things? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I think that's the problem with ideologies, too, though, is ideologies focus like bad re- forms of religion ideologies focus on the abstract goals rather than on concrete goals that have been proven and tested to be actually good goals and good means to those goals the other thing about postmodernism that's a problem is that it tries to deconstruct the past and start afresh and anew with everything right there there's always this new rebuilding and new reconstructing and new right but in order to do that, you need to deconstruct, question everything, deconstruct everything. But what you lose from that is the wisdom of time-tested ideas and practices. You know, 
and in lo- when you lose that, uh, what happens is people start to see those time-tested practices and they're like, why do we do that? And since they can't answer it immediately, they're just like, that must be stupid. Let's deconstruct that and start over again. Mm-hmm. Instead of acting... Let's, act- je- let's jettison that because it's not relevant to me right now or... Or I don't see how that would help. Right. Or it's in my it's in my way of what I want to do. Yeah. That sort of thing. Yeah. And I also want to go talk about how you're talking about how it just focuses on like abstract things, but also it focuses on others. Like other people mm. that don't that aren't like you. Mm. <clears throat> so basically if 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 I'm this way and that other person is that way, then I can focus my, all my hate and all my energy and all my all my all my anxiety and all, all the stuff that I'm trying to do or not all the things that I fall short on, right? That I don't, I'm not going to fix myself. I'm going to fix them. It's all focused on how they are bad and how they need to, to, to fall in line and how they are this and they are that. But there's not a focus on, you know, what's wrong with me? Am I selfish? In, in some am of these I, ideologies, am right? Am I lazy? Do, right. I, do I not, like I said, do that contribute? The things that Jordan Peterson's talking about is, you know, instead of looking on all that stuff out there, you need to like fix this in here yep. first. Fix what's inside of you, and then then go out there. And I think Jesus says the same thing. You know, yeah. You know, remove this, remove the plank in your own eye before you try to remove the speck in somebody else's. Um, you know, there's a lot more in wrong with you inside than there are, you know, maybe with somebody outside that you're trying to fix, because you know. The, the dirty vessel is is the one you're in and so clean that first and then and then try to then offer some suggestions to clean somebody else well i think that's the one of the great insights that religion that good religion has is that that emphasis on or priority of the clean up your own house f- before you try to clean up other people's houses obviously christ just literally just said as much um but other religions have that too that that sort of self-reflection like before i try to go out there and do something i need to clean this up uh and i think in some ways some of the social justice movements try to do that but in some strange way that i haven't quite put my finger on that's not the same way as religion does Mm -hmm. uh and i'm still not i'm still trying to think that through because i i I think the whole um, Robin D'Angelo stuff, for example, uh, with like white fragility, I think what it's trying to do is something like that, maybe, is this sort of self-cleansing or this self-get your act together. But there's Mm -hmm. something fundamentally different about it that I can't quite put my finger on that I really want to try to flush out. I mean, what I think, too, is... With Rob, with, with uh, what you're talking about with right, white fragility and 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 those who, those who would accept, you know, kind of what she's what she's saying, is, I think what it makes people do ultimately is makes them feel better, about, what that who they are, what group they belong to, because if you feel bad about yourself in the way that they want you to, then that gives you an excuse to say, well, you know, I have no choice. This is who I, this is where I was born. This is the color of my skin. I, I have no choice but to feel this, but what the, but to be this way. I'm sorry about it. It's horrible, but there's nothing I can do about it. So it makes them feel better, but it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't, it doesn't make any relationship between people of different cultures or different co- colors or different religions better. It's just making somebody feel better. Yeah, it is. And I think that 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 and that in itself, it serves no ultimate purpose beyond your own self gratification. I mean, I think it's 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 more of moralizing self gratification. <laughs> that's that's what I that's what I think it is. Yeah, you could be onto something. I mean, I I think with the, the like with Robin D'Angelo by the end of that book, you're just like, what what are we trying to do? Like, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and maybe I'm, I just am too dense to have seen it, but I, I'm, I wasn't quite sure what was trying to be accomplished by, by D'Angelo. That was substantial. That was like, okay, this, like you said, that could really fix something that could really, 
Um, if it's all just a bunch of sort of self-evaluation and psychologizing, and then with, carried with that is like she she wants to get rid of the negative stereotypes of say like internalized racism or like or, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah so she wants to get rid of the guilt for that I'm like well seems like that's a bad thing well, you should feel guilty for being racist right I mean that's yeah. uh, why would you want to get rid of the guilt of doing something bad or be, yeah. being something bad and I think too like with, with a solution right like what do, how do we fix this thing like there's there's a part of ancient wisdom that says love one another as lo, love your neighbor as yourself you know do unto others as you would have done unto you if everybody lived that way the world would not be the way it is yeah that's a very simple very practical way of living your life the golden rule which, by the way, we used to teach in school. We don't anymore. You know, how do we expect kids to treat each other nicely unless they understand that that's, you know, that's a rule. You know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you said before, postmodernism, get rid of all that ancient stuff, get rid of all the, the objective T truths and all that. Um, you know, treating others as you want them to treat you should be an objective moral truth that everybody should adhere to. And if we all did that, what what would the world look like? And also, if we took responsibility for our own lives and not blamed other people for what we have or what we don't have, and we do things in our life to be responsible and to contribute to society in a positive way, what if we all did that? What would the world look like? It'd be a witch witch on every corner. Yeah. Nice, crispy sandwiches. <laughs> cool. But yeah, so um, I just want to thank everybody for sticking with us. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode on postmodernism. If you have any questions or want, to, want us to explore other topics, let us know. But uh, Matt, as always, thank you for being part of this. And uh, we will uh, hopefully talk to or hopefully see you guys later. Thanks.